hot sugar. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, honey, honey. I did not see that coming. <laughs> Questions? Nathaniel Sizemore. Good morning, Brian and Derica. Good morning. It's actually five to one, but we'll go with it. With the use of brown sugar, are you collecting a rum-like flavoring? Also, what are the SG amounts for a pound of white sugar, brown sugar, molasses, maple syrup, and honey to a gallon of water? That's a really good question. Derek's going to answer that in a little bit. As far as the rum-like flavor from brown sugar, not really. Um, molasses can kind of do that. Brown molasses sugar can do that. Trickle. Yeah, I have not noticed too much of a rum flavor because rum flavor really is much like whiskey, where it comes from the wood that it's stored in, not really from what the alcohol was made from. Although, sort of. Kind of. In a way. Mark B. How do you figure out the sugars in solids? I've made a few wines now. No failures yet, but a few mistakes. The last wine I made was a raisin and rice wine I got off YouTube. Leftovers from my cupboard. Ingredient. Well, we, he gives the ingredients. It's not, not important to the question. There was lots. <laughs> um, it went completely dry, so I guess it would be around 40.5. I'm not super accurate on my readings. Tastes closer to 16. That's impressive. If you can tell the difference between 14.5 and 16% alcohol by taste, I, I don't know that I can do that. <laughs> That's impressive. Um, either the drink is naturally strong tasting or the sugars in the solids took too long to come out and messed up my OG. Again, I'd imagine rice break down slowly. Well, interesting thing about rice, and we are going to do a rice wine video, all you people that have been asking. The reason we haven't is because there is a very specific thing you need to break down rice. It works much like beer. The, the grains in beer have starch in them, that you cannot ferment. You have to use the enzymatic action of heating it to like 155 degrees and you have, okay, short story. Enzymes come out because of the heat, they're already in the grain, they break the starches down into sugars which the yeast can then convert. Rice has a similar problem. It's a starch that needs to be broken down. However, it does not have the enzymes already in it. No amount of heating it is going to change that. As I learned when I tried to make rice wine myself, it tasted like crap. So there's a specific type of yeast, and it's it's the Chinese yeast balls, Asian yeast balls, that you have to use in order to do this. We have some on order. When I get them, we'll be making a rice wine because we have a 35-pound bag of rice that I'd like to use up. It's right here. <sighs> it's been right here. It's in the way. For like a month. <laughs> um, anyway, he was asking about how we know how much sugar is in solids, like berries and fruits. Derek will be answering that question in a few minutes. Robin Hood, one, two, three, four, five, four, one, four, oh. I guess Robin Hood, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, four, one, three, nine was already taken. Anyway, hey, I had a quick question you might be able to answer, hopefully. Uh, so I'm brewing four apple hard ciders and I added one cup of sugar to each. Overkill. Four hard ciders. There's one cup of sugar each. They have been fermenting for about two weeks now. I took the airlocks off to smell them to make sure nothing's wrong. When I smelled each one, they smelled like strong malt liquor. Beer. Did I use too much sugar or... Okay. Well, here's the thing. Apple, when it's fermenting, can sometimes smell like beer. It's um, because what we equate with beer brewing is actually the alcohol and some of the chemicals being produced by the fermentation process. So yeah. I'm not surprised at all that it smells yeah. like it. It's not the fault of the sugar, it's the fault of the apple. Yeah. Now, when I added a cup of sugar to each, a cup of sugar to what size? If you added it to a quart, then I'd say well, it's too much. If you added it to, to a gallon, I'd say it probably didn't do a whole lot at all because a cup of sugar is a little under a half a pound. So it might have added 23 points of gravity. I don't think it really did all that much. But without knowing the volume, it's hard for me to actually answer that question. So, uh, Robert Arstad, I was under the impression that beer makes about 10 points of non-fermentable sugars during the fermentation process and that you should figure that into your final gravity. Have you heard that before? Yes heard that before, it also varies. And as far as building that into your final gravity, it's already built in. It's already part of your final gravity. So you should be aware of it so that, like we had somebody um, recently, I probably should have pulled this one up. I couldn't find it though. They said, my beer went down to 10, 12. How can I get it to go further? And I said, there's nothing left to ferment. And they didn't understand. They wanted to add more yeast and add more sugars to make it ferment more. And I said, if you add more yeast, nothing's going to happen. If you add more sugars and more yeast or more sugars, it's going to ferment those sugars and just create more alcohol. But it's probably still going to end at the same gravity because those that gravity is coming from a sugar type that the yeast cannot break down. And that's all that means. It's still sugar. It counts in the gravity. It's adding to the density of the liquid, but it's not fermentable. So the yeast can't consume it. 
It's a wonderful way to keep beer sweet. I mean, beer sweet. That's why we add hops to it. Not just for preservation. It's actually to make it less sweet, too, because otherwise it would just be, like, kind of nasty to drink. I mean, i, I got to try it sometime just because. <laughs> We've had people say, I don't like hops at all. I want to make beer without it. And I always go, are you sure? <laughs> but I'm going to do it just because now I'm curious. Um, I think that answered his question, huh? Ma Zeus, Maya Zeus. I never know how to say that, but this is a long time commenter. They've been around for a long time. And they like to keep me in line, too. In a good way, usually. Usually. I was wondering, how much difference is there if you back sweeten mead with sugar versus honey? The flavor of honey is already there, but the sweet fermentable sugar is gone, which gets added back in the form of sucrose. Obviously, you add honey, you get even more honey flavor, but how much of a difference is there really? Just a little idea for a future video and maybe even ABX test. ABX? Uh, I think an ABV. Um, okay, that's a good question, and this comes up a lot. And here's my take on it. You can go either way. Someone just asked this in the, the VIP group. If you have to back sweeten, you can go either way. You can add brown sugar, honey, sugar, maple syrup, molasses, whatever you want, any kind of sweetener you want. They're all going to add their own subtle variety to it. If you made a mead and you add more honey, you might get a little bit more honey flavor, depending on how much you end up adding. Keep in mind, a half a pound of honey over a gallon isn't really all that much. It's not going to change the flavor profile very much. But one thing to remember is sugar is, as much as it's empty calories, it's also empty of flavor. So it may just sweeten it without changing the flavor at all, which might be desirable in some things. Like if it's already very honey forward and you don't want to add more, use sugar. If it doesn't have enough honey flavor and you want it to have a little bit more honey flavor, add honey. Your sugar selection for fermentation versus your sugar selection for back sweetening, you're going to take in very different... Yeah. Uh, options there because in fermenting you're using it as a food source for your yeast and back sweetening it's a food source for you it's a food source for you and a flavorant for your brew yeah. because it's not getting fermented out mm -hmm. so keep that in mind when you do your choices and if you are concerned about well how is this going to affect my brew a real simple and fun way is to get little tiny glasses Put a little bit of your brew in there and a little bit of the sugar that you're thinking about back sweetening mix it all up and take a drink just don't do too many of those in one day yeah <laughs> the last ones will be vastly inaccurate um something else that i was going to say and i completely forgot what i was going to say oh yeah in our fey wine video where we did the tasting of it and we hemmed and hawed about should we add honey should we add sugar we ended up where the flavor itself wasn't all that strong and pronounced, so we added honey instead of sugar because we wanted to add a little more complexity. Someone actually asked a really good question, um, and I, I did, should have thought of it here. They said, because I said the flavor was boring, what's honey going to do to it? One thing you got to remember, there's two things, well, there's actually three. MSG, salt, and sugar all are flavor enhancers. MSG, too many letters. Too long of a name. I don't like it. It's not natural. I'm not going to use it. Gives me headaches. Yeah. <laughs> Sugar and salt, however, are flavor enhancers. If you've ever noticed, you cannot make a baked good without salt in it. It'll taste flat and boring. It won't taste good. Most things, if you add sugar to them, taste better. That's why we all love Chinese food, right? <laughs> they put a lot of sugar in their food. I don't know why. Especially takeout places. It's insane. But anyway, those two things are flavor enhancers. So we had this wine that had great bones. Everything about it, there was a lot of, a lot of underlying tones, but nothing was coming forward. Adding a little bit of honey to it brought all that out. That's what honey can do. Sugar would have done the same thing, but the honey added an extra back note of complexity. That's why we chose honey in that case. Uh, Blackfire. Hi, Brian. What do you think of sweetening with non-fermentable sugars like xylitol and stevia? Xylitol? Um, probably not. It's an alcohol. It's a sugar alcohol. It just... I've read, I've read up on this stuff, and... I don't, I don't like what I read. It's just not, doesn't seem good. Stevia, if you grow it yourself and grind up the leaves, absolutely, that stuff is awesome. However, the stevia that you buy that looks like sugar, you might as well use xylitol. It's, it's processed stuff. It's not really good. There's a whole story on stevia that maybe someday I'll do a video on. I read this whole expose. It's nuts. However, if you buy a green powder that's called stevia, you can use that. I don't guarantee that it'll come out as sweet as you might like, 
but it does actually help a bit. We tried doing it for coffees and teas, and I it mix, sort of worked. I'm, I do a big jug of steeped um, yeah. iced tea, and I put the stevia right in now with the Now, for that, tea, it actually worked really it well. Out. It does have a little bit of almost a bitter uh, back note to it, but it does sweeten. It, yeah. it does make it sweeter. Um, Ryan Disney. Any relation? Could you carbonate a wine by going about the normal method of adding enough fermentable sugars to carbonate it and add a non-fermentable sugar like lactose to sweeten it, in essence, to make a sweet carbonated wine? Yes, you absolutely can. However, you want to do it the other way around. You want to sweeten it and then carb it, because if you carb it, then you can't actually add the sweetener to it, which is probably what he meant. Anyway, I just want to be clear so that no one asks me that question later. Yes, what he's doing is basically you put in enough priming sugar so that you have a controlled fermentation for carbonation, and he put in some artificial sweetener, you know, non-fermentable sugars, so that it won't keep fermenting, but it has a sweet flavor. Yes, you can absolutely do that. We actually could do that with our sparkling cider, but I'm going to teach you how to do it using all fermentable sugars, and it just, um, it's just, I like it better. It's just the way I always do it. On to you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. So, before we get into all the numbers and science of sugar, let's talk about the real culprit here, and that's yeast the eater of the sugars. And I learned something interesting, curious, peculiar, all those fancy words about yeast. They are picky eaters. Do you have a friend, perhaps it's you, you don't have to answer, who likes to have their food on their plate not touching and will eat a specific item first before moving on to the next? I mix it all together and then eat it. Yeast is like that. They're going to eat a specific sugar first and then go down the row, regardless of the amounts of those sugars. So, what does this mean about anything that we're talking about? It means when you are making your brewing profile, you can take this knowledge and use it to your benefit. So you will have the sugars that you want left being in the category that the yeast is going to eat last. Let me clarify. Most brewers' yeast work on sucrose first, breaking down into glucose and fruco fru fructose. Sorry. Um, they then consume the glucose first, followed by fructose, then maltose, and finally... Maltotriose. Maltotriose. I think we'll call it that. I might be pronouncing it wrong, and I'm probably pronouncing lots of things wrong, because that's what I do. Of course, being that they're live little beasties, they may vary it up, but in general, that's their order of sugar eating. Most yeast strains are glucophilic. Glucophilic. Thank you. Utilizing most of the glucose in the brew before consuming the other sugars. And what this means is the way they absorb the sugars, sometimes they'll bring them into their cell walls to eat them, sometimes they'll keep them out of their cell walls. There's lots of science about the molecule structure and whatever, and that's not important. But what is important is the order that they eat the sugars. So, what are all these glucose, fructose, maltose sugars? I'm glad you asked. Let's go on. Something that was meant that, that comes up here that I thought was really interesting that I did not actually know. It is possible that if there's too much sucrose and glucose in the, in the wort, that it will actually stop them from fermenting maltose altogether, which is actually why a lot of high gravity warts get stuck. It's not because there's too much sugar, it's because the yeast got picky and basically ate up all the stuff that they liked and now they just don't have an appetite anymore. Yep. In, in general layman's terms, that's what happened. Yep. But it's actually more of a chemical reaction than, than that. They probably got more attuned to the sucrose and glucose, and now the maltose is just something they don't want to ferment. It, in effect, switched into a non-fermentable sugar for them. So no amount of adding anything is going to change that in some stuck fermentations, and that's just yeah. a fact. So what's the moral of the story? Don't start with too high of a gravity. But we're not done yet. So I have this inordinately long list of sugars and their components. We're not going to go through it all. And we're not going to go through it all. We're going to go we'll through the ones we deal with on a regular basis. Now, this is what I wanted to say is we only use a few of these types of sugars and we do it on purpose. One, they're easily available and we go with stuff that most of the time you can buy at the grocery store or off of Amazon. We don't really go for super exotic stuff that you have to order special to get and things like that because a, 
why, and B, most of our audience can't get half the stuff that we talk about as it is, so I don't want to make it that much harder for, you know, everybody to get. Another thing, um, before I get started on this list of sugars, is the difference between fermentable and unfermentable sugars. As Brian was discussing with beer, the natural process of making beer, breaking down the starches into sugars, creates naturally unfermentable sugars, and that means the yeast simply won't eat them. All right, so on to the sugars. We're going to start with table sugar. That's white sugar. That's good old sugar sugar. It is 100% fer ferment fermentable. It is constitutes of sucrose, and it can be used for priming, as Brian was talking about, for when you're going to um, ferment a beverage, or as a component in the brew to increase the alcohol, and in the case of beer, it would lighten the body, the beer. Now, a lot of people will alternate that for corn sugar, which is glucose. It'll be more easily fermented. It's still 100% fermentable, but it's ease, more easily fermented, and a lot of people like to use that for priming sugar, saying that regular table sugar will make it taste bad. Okay, no, they're wrong. It won't make it taste bad. If you used that in your entire brew, there might be a slight flavor difference, but I don't really don't think so. For priming, there's really no difference at all. Okay, let's not get crazy about this. I don't use corn sugar. I just don't. Not for any particular reason other than it's another thing I'd have to buy. I buy sugar because I put it in my coffee. We cook with it, we bake with it, and we brew with it. It's an all-in-one. So I'm going to move on now to molasses and treacle. They're keeping this in the same category because it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it varies on its fermentability roughly 90%, and that's because it is a combination of sucrose, invert sugars, and dextrins. dextrins Talk about invert sugar in a moment. There's a reason. And dextrins are unfermentable, thus mm -hmm. the variability of the fermentability of molasses and treacle. Which makes me wonder, when you cook honey, you are creating probably a dextrin. Probably. That's why it becomes unfermentable, because molasses is a cooked down sugar, yep. essentially. So yep. that's interesting. It's funny how they all come around. So. Yeah. Um, if you go to lots of brewing blogs, particularly brew blogs, uh, beer blogs seem to be everywhere. Yeah. They will talk about caramelized sugars being unfermented, and they're right to a certain degree. It depends on how well they're cooked. As you cook a sugar down, you you are creating unfermentable sugars, and the degree of that will vary with yeah. the amount that you cook it down. So there's no way to say how much of that's unfermentable. Yeah. Once you get to ash, it's probably all unfermentable. <laughs> but who wants that? Yeah. Wouldn't be so good to add ash to your brew, though. So the degree of fermentability is unknown. That's why it says varies 90%, probably 50 to 70%. It's probably because of inconsistency in, the, in what it's made from. Right. Because it's not made for brewing. It's made to be a food additive. So it's just and wildly And as we mentioned earlier, it can cause rum or wine-like flavors. Honey! We don't know anything about honey. Dun, dun, dun! Never use the stuff. It is 95% fermentable. Fermentable. <laughs> it includes fructose, glucose, and sucrose at 18% water. It, I, I don't really... What they mean is um, most commercial honeys have to be about 18% water. Okay. So that was just a side note to take meal. Mm -hmm. Honey is high fructose mixture of sugars which will impart honey-like flavors. Duh. That honey gives honey-like flavors? No way! That depend on the nectar source. And we've mentioned this multiple times in our meads of when we're selecting a honey, we select a specific type of honey based on the flavors we want imparted into our mead. That's it. I've never really noticed that much difference. It's very subtle. It's a subtle difference. Especially when you start putting in other things. Most of the time, any other thing you put in there is going to overpower whatever subtlety there might sure. be. The most neutral honey supposedly is clover honey. Um, wildflower is pretty neutral. Wildflower would be probably second neutral, and we use that frequently. And then there's orange blossom, there's orange orange. blossom that we use a lot, too. All the way to some of the crazy stuff. Yes, yes. If you watch our video where we did our fancy... Yeah. Um, but then there's like Manuka honey and all this kind of stuff. Follow too. the honey. There are some wonderful, okay. elaborate honey for profiles out there. Which would be cool for back sweetening. Stuff. Yes. You yes, never it do it. We have to try it. Okay, and so the final honey that I'm going to talk about is maple syrup. It's 100% fermentable. It includes sucrose, fructose, glucose, and it's a 34% water. 
Maple syrup is mostly sucrose. Grade B syrup will provide more maple flavor than grade A. So I thought it was important to read that part because it's probably counterintuitive. You would think yeah. that the grade A would be the better maple, but apparently the grade B imparts the maple flavor. I wish I could have used better. that argument when I was in school, but mom, B is better than A. <laughs> I am going to be writing an article on our website, link in description below, about the sugar and talking about and having the charts and stuff so you can have all this information at your resource. Uh, so the next thing I'm just going to gloss over is talking about the different sugar types. So I've mentioned glucose, fructose, there's a whole list here and that's going to be on the website and it's going to talk about the different types. It's constitutes. So like monosaccharides are single sugar type and then disaccharides are double sugar type and trisaccharides are three sugar types. So those are the constitutes for the disaccharides. And Again, a little science -ish. Yes. So it's very science-y and that's why I'm not really going to go into depth in it for here, but it talks about the fermentability and the unfermentability of those different sugar types. The last thing, which I thought was super exciting, was a list of fruit their percentage of sugar, and their pH. We're going to be talking on a different show about acids and tannins and why pH is important for not only preserving, but for creating a more uh, rounded mouthfeel for your brew. We're not going to get into all these, but I will say one thing, just glancing through this list, every single one of these except for one is too acidic to brew with, technically. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So the, the pH range is from... And it's the one that everybody says doesn't work. 2.3 <laughs> to 5.6. So that is a huge range for fruits and their pHs. Ideal pH range for brewing is 5 to 5.5. So the only one that's actually in that range is watermelon. Yeah, which is supposed to be a real awful thing to ferment. So yeah, Probably because it doesn't have enough acidity. So <laughs> we have, um, let's see, the highest sugar comes from dates at 60% sugar. All dates should be sweet. Aww. Aww. <laughs> um, so that is really interesting, and I'm super curious to make a date wine. And then the lowest on the sugar rating here is cranberry at 4% sugar. But we've had super success doing cranberry brews. That we added sugar to. But we always added sugar, either in table sugar or honey. So, again, this list, all these lists, all these numbers will be available for you on the website. I hope this has cleared up some of the insanity about sugars and all the different options that are out there for you in creating your own brew. But I think the most exciting part, at least for me... I was throwing the papers just now. No, that was the most exciting part for Brian. Oh, right. The most exciting part for me is learning how yeasts consume sugars and knowing that... Yeah, that was neat. I didn't know that. That list of consumption will help you in making a, an interesting profile for your brew. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>